Hello and welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with your hosts Sydney Timmons and Becky Lawrence. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that we will be covering a diverse range of mental health topics that may be distressing to some listeners. You can find a full list of the topics being covered in each episode in the show notes. Please check the show notes before listening to any of our episodes. Welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with me, Sydney Timmons, and joining me today is the secret psychiatrist. Hello, everybody. I'm the secret psychiatrist. So this episode is focusing on the book that we did last week, which is called My Courage to Tell by Laura E. Corbeth. And I thought we would start this podcast just as a quick reminder with the book blurb again. So it says, My Courage to Tell is the story of one woman's struggle to overcome a childhood of abuse at the hands of her cruel, bullying brother. Memories of this abuse remain deeply buried until an aunt dies in Manhattan, leaving an estate Laura Colbeth must settle with her estranged brother. As she tries to administer the estate, Laura is played by symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Suppressed memories start to rise to the surface. Laura begins to remember and to face a childhood of psychological and physical abuse. No cuts, no bruises, no scratches. Her brother is sly, constraining her to spit in her face, lick her or perform tickle torture. He took pleasure in dominating her and playing on her fears, relishing his control over his younger sibling. His lies and manipulations terrified her. Witnessing his torture of animals left no doubt in Laura's mind that her tormentor would follow through on his threat that he would kill her if she told. And where were her parents? Rather than investigating Laura's deteriorating situation, they believed their son's continuous lies as he denied his abuse of Laura. When they did catch glimpses of their son's cruelty, they put it down to sibling rivalry. But it was not sibling rivalry. It was ruthless, relentless, psychological and physical abuse. And by not dealing with it, her parents were complicit. Unheard, unprotected, Laura was completely on her own. My Courage to Tell is one of the first memoirs to shine a light on abuse from a sibling's perspective. It also reveals how families that buy into the lies and manipulations, ignore the problems and stonewall, enable the abuser and foster mental illness. Travel with Laura as she uncovers her past, finds the help and courage to face the past, and ultimately confronts her abuser and her family. So there was a lot in this book, I have to admit. So Mm. we had a quick discussion before we started about what kind of things you might want to talk about. Yeah, so when I listened to the podcast, when you were talking about this book, there were so many different topics that were almost screaming out at me in the first 20 minutes. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into all of them today. But just the flavor of some of the things I picked up on in the first 15 minutes were issues about sibling rivalry, possible conduct disorder, family therapy issues, neglect, abuse, bullying, authoritarian parenting, hoarding, post-traumatic stress disorder, attachment disorder, to name just a few. Yeah, I mean, as I said, there is a lot going on in this book. There are so many different topics that we could discuss, but perhaps we can focus today on PTSD. Particularly in Laura's case, for Laura, PTSD is probably the most pressing issue she has to deal with, even though she has to deal with all of the other things as well. But perhaps we can do other episodes later on with those topics. So did you want to start with PTSD? Yeah, so post-traumatic stress disorder, I mean, this can happen with anyone at any age, but it can also happen in children, which is really interesting because back in the 80s, you know, they thought children couldn't have this because yeah. they didn't have the capacity to get, well, I'll say PTSD because it's shorter, but it actually can. And actually up to 6% of children and adolescents can have that. Is it possible to ask a bit more about capacity? So you say that in the 80s they thought that children didn't have the capacity to, is it suffer from trauma or experience trauma? What do you mean by capacity? So, good question. I think, you know, back in the day there was such little research, especially with children and what 
they were capable of understanding their development cognitively and their behavior uh, circumstances as well and how they approach situations but so much more research has gone into the psychological aspect as well as the scientific aspect of their brain development so when I say capacity I mean the ability to experience trauma just as adults can experience trauma and have symptoms as well and go through those I'll say psychologic psychological traumatic events and for them to go through that so kids are also impacted by trauma depending on their individual circumstances they obviously have the capacity to manage and overcome trauma but that's for children especially they need to be in a supportive environment with a supportive adult or carer to let them manage that and go through that so I'll give an example if a child has seen something quite traumatic I don't know that's something horrific like a murder that obviously has a capacity on a child on some sort of level because they do have the cognitive ability to take in that information in some way possibly not quite clear cut as an adult would and I'll go into the cognitive development of a child when we talk about attachment disorder in much more detail but they are able to process that information and manage that in a way that's healthy for them if they're if they have the tools around them, i.e. the supportive adult. But they will be impacted differently as well, depending on their own individual development, such as if they have any medical problems themselves or they're not in that supportive environment, if they're prone to neglect or no one's there to help them and support them as well. Well, that does make more sense as what was meant by capacity. And it's always good to hear that there is this positive if the child is in the best environment for them to overcome trauma, that it isn't a case of if they've seen a traumatic event, then we are going to have major problems with them for the rest of their life later on. So that's just really interesting. Yeah, and it was reported about 0.4% actually in a in a survey in Britain that children between 11 to 15 years old have PTSD diagnosed and girls are more likely than boys to get it about twice, which not many people know. Yeah. Yeah, that is surprising. Can I ask what kind of things does a person go through to end up with a PTSD diagnosis? So most common reasons for getting PTSD in children at adolescence are physical, sexual abuse, uh, which can be very chronic for the child or adolescent, domestic violence, school violence, you know, terrorist attacks now, unfortunately, which are more what's happening, accidents such as with vehicles, natural disasters, you know, earthquakes, hurricanes, that kind of thing, fires, especially, as I said, Grenfell Tower, which is become quite prevalent recently and the child can have certain symptoms you know being feeling horrified agitated quite disorganized in the way they're coming across when they're talking to you very fearful and quite helpless as well so in childhood trauma it's actually in two types there's a type one and there's a type two the type one is diagnosed when you have one one sort of event so one traumatic event and it's most common in children. So they'll have a, so it might be, I don't know, an earthquake, you know, happened once, then and there, and that's what it's about. So type two is when you have repeated exposure to something. So for instance, here, abuse, so repeated physical abuse. And then that, the kind of symptoms with that, you have denial. And it goes quite similar to the book you were reading. So this woman seemed to have repressed repressed quite a lot of memories until later on it came out for whatever reason. So yeah, I think it comes out in Laura because she had to interact with her brother in association with her aunt's estate. And again, as she starts communicating with him, she could start seeing some of the old patterns that he was probably using towards her as a child and I think that's probably what has prompted those repressed memories to come to the surface. So that typically happens in type 2 when you have repeated exposure to some sort of abuse whereas in type 1 you the child can remember it you know explicitly you know the hurricane or happened on a Tuesday this is what I was doing this is what happened and they, they don't repress it so much you know they're very aware of what happened. 
But type two is sort of they numb themselves and they dissociate and they don't want to remember it. So they're, you know, unconscious prevents that from happening until they're able to deal with it possibly later on in life. And they get this sort of dissociation, this depersonalization sort of symptoms that might go with what this woman, the author, actually what she was saying. Yeah, I think so. So in the book, again, we go through Laura's treatment to process what happened to her during her childhood. But what what other treatments are there available for PTSD? Yes. Now, treatment, there are a few things. Most likely is trauma-focused cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT. This is usually given you know, 8 to 12 sessions. And you can have group treatments as well for a large number of people or separate ones, just for you and the clinician. There's also crisis intervention, psychological debriefing following a trauma, and that will be done with an expert. So you're not more likely to be traumatized after that session as well. And that'd be very structured. And it can be in a group, those of other children as well, to share their feelings and to knowledge and process it. And you can, but it's, Something to note is a single session debriefing for a child is not really supported by evidence. So just having a one-off session after trauma is not really of good practice, actually. The question that I had was the group debriefing. Is it a case of all the kids together have gone through the same trauma? I'm assuming that would have to be the case. Yeah, so it's some sort of similarity. Of, so I'll give you... I'll give you an example. So the recent shooting, unfortunately, in America. So I'm sure at some point there will have some sort of group therapy where the children get together and speak about, you know, what happened and the trauma they face together and reflect in that space together. So it will be a definite link of something that's happened. Obviously, you know, I went through an earthquake and you went through something completely different. So it will be something linked together. Yeah. Yeah. It's- <laughs> Yeah, it's just one of those things that I'm like, ah, I'm assuming that that would be the case, but I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. And medications are not really routinely to be given for children with PTSD. And it's it's better to have CBT, really, and to have that psychological treatment. But saying that, it's not that you can't give medication. It's just something to be aware of. So you can actually give citalopram. And that's been known to be quite helpful in PTSD in children as well. There is. So there's some myths about this as well. So some people say, oh, what about play therapy, art therapy, family therapy? There hasn't been really any a lot of evidence for PTSD in children to do those kind of therapies. So that's just something to note as well. So is there anything you that sort of struck out for you when I speak about PTSD? Just a quick thing about type 1 and type 2. So we did a podcast on a book called A Bitter Pill to Swallow and one of the characters has gone through a shooting and he basically blames himself and he is diagnosed with acute stress disorder which as I understand Mm. it is a precursor Mm. to PTSD. This book is set quite some time ago so I was just wondering if that's still the case, is there still acute stress disorder, PTSD and kind so of that relationship? Y- there is acute stress disorder. How I like to think of it, I mean, it's a separate diagnosis, but how I like yeah. to think of things, especially with mental health and this, well, there is a link. So, you know, that's like with anxiety as well. So these kind of stress sort of reactions, they all, there is always a link between one and the other. So it's not, you know, it's not like saying your foot is not related to your hand. I mean, it's a clear, obvious no, but with mental health, there's no clear yes or no. So there is a definite, obviously link because it is an acute stress reaction. And if that's not dealt with, that can later on, depending obviously what's going on, then become a trauma for that person and become a PTSD situation. So they could start off potentially with an acute stress disorder that hasn't necessarily been handled in the right way and then go on to be identified as having PTSD type 1. Yeah, as an example. As an example, yeah, Yeah, that could happen. Cool. Yeah, Yeah, I'm just trying to formulate it in my head as to the how it fits in with acute stress disorder Mm. just because we've already talked about that in a previous one. 
The other thing that you mentioned was that there is medication available, but it's not routinely prescribed to children. I was thinking maybe we could do another episode about medication and children, just generally, because I know that there's quite a lot of, I know parents out there that are concerned about medication and their children. I know that, I mean, ADHD, there's uh, Ritalin for children and it might just be a good one to have a little recap on. What did you think of that? No, definitely, definitely. I mean, there's so much to talk about. Um, I think these are really important questions and it's so common. Um, So I'll definitely be up for that as well. Brilliant. I'll put that on my list. All these things. (laughs) I'm just like, oh, it's another one. There's another one. Perfect. Well, that's pretty much the main things I wanted to speak about that really came out when I was listening to your podcast. Brilliant. So I also did some Googling. <laughs> yeah, that horrible word that I'm assuming that all doctors hate. Yeah. Dr. Google says I have. Oh, no. everyone does the Google. <laughs> yeah. That's actually my worst thing when I have someone that comes in and says, I've just seen on Google, it's like, oh, no. Yeah, really, no. Don't self-diagnose by Google, yeah, so please, exactly. people. <laughs> okay, tell me what you Googled. In- <laughs> yeah. I thought it'd be interesting just to find out what other common myths associated with PTSD. And quite a few of them, I thought, oh, yeah, I can understand why people would assume that. But the first one that jumped out to me is that people think that PTSD is a sign of mental weakness in other people. What do you think about that? And what is it true? Well, firstly, what is mental weakness? Um, there's no such diagnosis. I think it goes back to what I said with children and their capacity to understand trauma and experience that. It's the same with an adult. So you have a certain capacity as well to deal with the trauma. And if you also have been in that supported environment, understand it in a healthy manner, then, you know, that's fine. You can manage that trauma in a way that you can cope with life. But it goes back to, you know, how do you, how, what's your tolerance for stress? Everyone's tolerance for stress is completely different. So my tolerance for stress might be completely different to yours or uh, my colleague who is yeah. a surgeon and has a bleeding patient in front of him, his tolerance of stress is very different to me as well. So if you don't have the correct coping skills, the way you manage stress yeah. trauma is going to be different as well. And it also goes back with your childhood and attachment disorder, which I'll talk about. So if you had a parent that was so overbearing and controlling and said to you, for example, you know, you can't go outside because the world is a really scary place or something like that, your tolerance for stress will be completely different to a child where the parenting was much more healthy. So the child in the first circumstance with the overbearing parent that's afraid of everything, they are going to deal with trauma in a completely different way and they might be more at risk to not dealing with that stress of the trauma. So it's not about mental weakness, it's about what support systems you have, how you've developed cognitively and your childhood and how you were brought up in your attachments and how you cope in life as well and your tolerance for stress. That's so interesting. I'm sat here going, uh-oh, I might be on the the less, uh, how to say, it, the, the more dysfunctional parenting style where my parents were quite overbearing and you can't go out, everything's scary, and you're going to fall over and kill yourself just by <laughs> walking out the house. So... Uh oh. <laughs> well, that might also explain. No, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it might also explain some of the mm. reasons why I do have such issues with my own mental health in certain areas because I definitely feel stress. I don't know. When I look at other people, everyone else seems so much more capable <laughs> than I am. Anyway, so the next question that I had. So for Laura, we don't see her experiencing any symptoms of PTSD until a lot later in life. So when she is interacting with her brother and all of these repressed memories start to pop up and she starts having these stress reactions, so she has panic attacks, 
she ends up with extremely high blood pressure into hospital. It seems horrible for poor Laura. But one of the questions that I also found, or myths that I found, was that you can get PTSD immediately after experiencing trauma. But we don't see that for Laura. So I'm guessing that is another myth. That is another myth. Um, You can't diagnose PTSD straight away. Usually you, you can see it normally in cases within a month. And even so with Laura's case, it can be years later. It's very dependent on the person, actually. So some people experience it, you know, within a month, within the year. And it can be years later, but it can also be just like a graph. It can go up and down. So it might be certain periods of your life. It comes back up again. And it's normally you get three sort of categories of symptoms. So with Laura, it seems that she's getting the hyper arousal symptoms. So the physical sort of symptoms. And they can also include being quite angry, not getting enough sleep, getting your heart pounding, that kind of thing. The other categories can be avoidance, numbing, so really not thinking about it, avoiding the situation. An example of that is, say I was on a bus and the bus crashed and I resulted in getting PTSD. So I might avoid that situation later on by never going near a bus again or avoiding that route or where the situation happened. Another category is a re-experience. So typically you might get flashbacks again of that trauma. But that's definitely a myth. It can happen any time. You can get delay in symptoms as well. That makes sense. And again, kind of associated with that, I had found this myth that says PTS goes away as a person heals from trauma. And you said about the re-experiencing trauma later on. So just because you're starting to deal with it doesn't mean that you're never, ever going to feel PTSD symptoms again. Is, is that correct? Yeah, so... Everybody is different and how you manage it is different. The sooner the better, but I'm very careful when I say curable or not curable. It's not that PTSD is curable, but you can manage it so very well if you do the, say, the CBT um, or the trauma therapy. If you really hone that down and get your coping skills correct and manage that stress and that trauma you experience and deal with it instead of avoiding it, for example, you can really diminish your reactions that you're experiencing and reduce it in a way that you can cope with life. But obviously, you can get it again later on. But you, but you manage what you're doing and do the therapy you need to do, then it can seem as though it's cured. But nothing's curable, but you push it down to such a way that you can cope with life. Yeah, exactly. Now, that makes sense. So people shouldn't expect this miraculous thing where they're never, ever going to get hit by a trigger ever again. It could come up again. That's interesting. The way the mind works is just incredible. It really does oh, fascinate absolutely. me. So another common myth, people with PTSD are crazy and or Mm. dangerous. This is probably thanks to media exposure and the things that are reported in the press. But is this the case? So firstly, there's no crazy. um, So I don't like that media ever portray people that way. Secondly, with the danger. Now, I think what they're trying to say is you can be aggressive if you have PTSD. Now, you do, you can experience hyper arousal symptoms. So, for example, your sleep can be affected. You can be irritable. You can be more angry, but that doesn't mean you're aggressive. But there has, there has been cases where people have shown anger, if that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. I think it's probably the fact that people have reported that veterans that have gone off to war have come back with flashbacks and as a result have gone around starting to kill people, which I'm guessing is an extreme case if it has happened. Wow. Well, I've never, yeah, I've never experienced that. I have seen cases where people have gone to say a rock mm. and they do get the flashbacks and the hyper arousal symptoms but that doesn't make you dangerous it's just that you need to obviously get the coping skills in order to manage it and if you don't you can be prone to being more irritable and angry from a lack of sleep mm. but it's not that 
that causes you to be a completely dangerous person. It's just you can be more angry. But if that's if you're a kind of person that you have that ability to hurt people as well as you getting the symptom from PTSD, I mean, that's something completely different. You can get angry doing PTSD, but that doesn't mean you're going to go and hurt people. So another common myth that seems to be all over Google is that experiencing trauma, which I assume most of us in the world will experience a trauma at some point in our lives. It's not just going to be people that have PTSD, but experiencing trauma is enough to develop PTSD. And in some ways, that kind of suggests to me that we're all walking around suffering from PTSD, but I assume that that isn't the case. No, so PTSD, if you think about what it actually is, it's it can develop following any event that makes you fearful for your life in a so in a way that you remain in this sort of psychological shock and it leaves you feeling helpless so that's not from any trauma so for instance I've been in an earthquake but I'm not traumatized by it and there's me so I going how why how <laughs> I'm just like I think it would freak me out a bit oh the earthquake so on a personal note I was in Nepal and I was in a leprosy hospital volunteering and it just so happened, I don't know how, maybe it's my bad luck, but there was an earthquake and I was on top of a very remote, because I like to go to very remote places to me- see medicine, and I was on a very remote sort of mountain in this leprosy hospital in Anandaban, and I honestly didn't know what to do, you know, I've never experienced earthquake before, I just remember grabbing my passport, running out, and unfortunately some people did die, wow. but I think... I don't know why I didn't have PTSD. It might be because I was able to deal with the situation then and there. So I thought about what happened. I, you know, reflected on that. And luckily, there was no harm to me. So maybe that's the reason as well. Um, Nothing physically happened to me. But it's just maybe I've got those coping skills and the strategy to think I know my limits and I know what affects me. And if I feel stressed, I need to So for me, when I feel stressed, I have to talk about it with somebody so I can reflect. Mm. And that's what I do after any situation I feel quite stressed about. And I haven't had any trauma from it. So it can happen. It's usually PTSD happens from some kind of trauma, but it's how you cope with that. And everyone is different. But if it's a situation that makes you so incredibly fearful, then you're more prone, obviously, to getting PTSD. Wow, that's so interesting. Oh, I've got so many stories. I'm sure I'll share them all with you at some point. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> I'm just like, you're in the pool and in an earthquake. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and there's me going, wow, my life is so boring. <laughs> no, no. I do sometimes say it like, as though I've just told you I've had cereal or something so normal. I do forget sometimes that obviously it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not. I'm like, Wow. Okay, so back to my list of things that I've pulled off of Dr. Google. Um, Let's have a look. Oh, yeah, people with PTSD cannot function. And I am assuming that that so is not the case, that these people are so wrong when they say that, oh, you've got PTSD, you can't function as a normal human being. No, I mean, if you go back to this podcast of Laura... You know, she had a situation where she had years of not even really experiencing these symptoms, it sounded like. And PTSD is very, in a way, it's quite fluid. It might happen a few months later, and it might be that you get these certain symptoms, such as, and you might not. So you might get the flashbacks, irritability, the lack of sleep, or you might not. And going back to the bus situation, and even in that case, you're still getting on with your life, you're still eating, you're still meeting your friends, it's just that you might be avoiding that particular bus. And that scenario where, say, you got into a bus accident, so you do get on with life, it's just you are so fearful of that particular trauma, whatever it is, that it makes you, you know, fearful and you're in that sort of shock. But that doesn't mean you can't get on with life, of course you can. But for some people who don't have the coping skills then obviously that might impact them even more that they can't say go on with 
you know, going to work or whatever it is. But in most cases, you know, people can get on with their life. So that was the main things that I found out on PTSD was Googling it. Thank you so much for going through some of the topics from My Courage to Tell. We have loads more that we're going to hopefully discuss in the near future, fingers crossed. But we hope that you enjoyed this episode. If you guys have any other questions about any of the things that we've discussed or you want some clarification, let us know and we will be able to deal with that and let you guys have an answer. You can get in contact with us via Twitter, via Facebook. You can email us at hello at mentalhealthbookclub.com. Usually people contact me on my website, www.thesecretpsychiatrist.com or on my Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at The Secret Psych. So I'll make sure that I put all of that into the show notes for people. Perfect. Next week's episode will be another one featuring The Secret Psychiatrist as we discuss childhood abuse. And then the following week will also be another one with the secret psychiatrist, and we will be discussing conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. If you can't wait to listen to those episodes, you can get those now if you head over to Patreon at patreon.com forward slash mhbc and become a supporter of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. And for as little as $2 a month, you would be able to access our shows in advance and be eligible for additional awards. So remember, it's okay to not be okay. And if you're not okay, talk. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. If you need additional help with your mental health, please contact the Samaritans on 116 123, which is a 24 hour helpline. And if you need additional information about mental health issues, please visit mind at mind.org.uk. Our next podcast will be with the secret psychiatrist discussing childhood abuse. Our next book will be Finding Audrey by Sophie Kinsella. If you'd like to find out more about the MHBC podcast, please visit our website mentalhealthbookclub.com We really hope that you enjoy this podcast and we would like to hear what you think. Please head over to Twitter and follow us at MHBC underscore podcast or head over to Facebook and follow our Facebook page which is Mental Health Book Club. If you would like to show your support further please share us with your family and friends and leave us a five star review wherever you get your podcasts. We are now on Patreon. Please head over to patreon.com forward slash mhbc to donate as little as $2 a month to the Mental Health Book Club podcast. As a result of your donation, you will get early access to some of our episodes. You will get specific episodes that are only for patrons and you'll be eligible to be entered into free prize draws. 